to be all together again. Would you stand with us, please, singing all, Hail the power of Jesus' name. All 
hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all, the chosen seed of his some from the fall. Hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Crown him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that we yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. <clears throat> Have you a heart that's weary? Tending a load of care Are you a soul that's seeking Rest from the burden you bear Do you know, do you know My Jesus, do you know, do you know My friend Not but sorrow you feel. Who hears your call for comfort? But for, for not you feel. Do you know, do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, do you know, my friend? Have you heard? time you cry, who understands your heartaches, who dries the tears from your eyes, do you know, do you know, my Jesus, do you know, do you know, my friend, have you heard, have you Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us open.
If I invite all our brothers and sisters into worship. You got this, Lord. You've got all of it. You, you're keeping us safe. Be with the ones that are traveling today. Be with the ones that are here. Be with the ones that are sick. Heal them, Lord, and bring them back to us. Be with Jeremiah as he gives a message. And be with my sister and I as we travel, leaving in the morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before you sit down, wave to someone. Wave. Hey, hey. <laughs> hi, hi. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. I can't wait till that part's over. All right. <laughs> All right, so... I got one announcement. So, Marika, you know, with all the virus stuff, looking for hand sanitizers and all that stuff, because we're starting to get low. Um, Marika told me we we're going over the blight. She's like, you need to get some hand sanitizer for the church. And so while I was in line, they had hand sanitizer right there. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get this. And being in Blythe, right, you have hemp hand sanitizer. Okay. So I bought hemp sanitizer. Yeah. So if anyone would like to use it, uh, wait till after church. So you just <laughs> wander on that. I just thought that was funny. So but it, it doesn't have the, what is it, HTC in it, so don't worry. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Candace. Yeah. So I don't know what to do with this now. Here you go, Jim. <laughs> so um, we are the family of God, and we like to, uh, what? Uh, is, I'm not. I have a story about no. Yeah. Um, um, so. <laughs> you guys have been away too long. <laughs> this is way too comfortable here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we're the family guy. We like to celebrate birthdays. So did anyone have a birthday from last Monday to today? Yeah, we got one. Where? Oh, hey. Lucy is. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And may you have a wonderful year. May you grow in your knowledge of God. And may you be a blessing to everyone around you. Thank you for being a. God bless you too. Love you, Lucy. First time I met Lucy, we were doing a work project at her house, yeah. cleaning up um, so she could get out of here, and then she came back. So <laughs> it didn't really work, so we didn't do a good job. Sure it did. She's uh, here. So do we have any uh, anniversaries from last Monday to today? No? No one gets married. No anniversaries. anniversaries. To, you did. Oh, we sing anyway. We'll sing. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. And may you continue Yay. to be a blessing. You never forget. You have been a blessing so far since I've known you. Yes. And so I, I pray that you continue to do that. Thank you for being a part of our family. Yes. Um, a little insight if you remember Nikki, yes, okay, she got married on Saturday. Nikki, uh, Nikki, she used to be in our youth uh, group. So some yeah. of you haven't been here since then. But uh, Jan and I know she graduated from her, college her two years ago, and she just got, she was supposed to get married at the end of June, um, but because of the whole virus situation, I she couldn't. So they did their vows. Um, so they got married on Saturday. And they're going to have the, the whole shindig later on, sometime in January or something like that. Um, and I told her, I sent her, we're going through 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, a little later on, there's this verse that says, if you burn with passion, get married. And so I sent that to her. <laughs> I'm like, uh -oh. you might as well just do it, right? Just get it done. And so um, she thought that was not very funny. So, uh, so Jim, why don't you come on up? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? 
Good. There's not very many announcements today. Um, no tops, no ladies quilting, no breakfast. Teen Friday night. You going to go? Okay, good. Anybody else going to go? <laughs> I've always made this offer. It's always open. We are having tops still. Oh, you are? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you'll be meeting Tuesday at 7 and through 9 over here. Good. Okay, good for you. They're not going to hold us down very long. Yeah. Um, I, that's all I have. I don't know what to do. That's the quickest I've ever gone through this. <laughs> um, we talked about it in Sunday school, uh, this covine thing that everybody slowed down, not, not doing hardly anything. The um, 47th Psalm, first chapter, or first verse says, be still and know that I am God. There's other, but that's what I want to bring up. Be still and know that I am God. Are people being still finally? Yeah. Finally. What did it take for people to be still? Next time, don't wait so long. <laughs> okay. Um, potluck. Where? Ooh, I better look at both sides. 31st. That's next Sunday? No? The following. I'll bring it up later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's some more there. Pay attention to them. Uh, that's all. I, anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Um, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> okay, there's the cook. Ask him. <laughs> The, the ACs yes. are like not kicking on. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. <laughs> he said yes. Yes. Okay, there'll be hot dog and hamburgers. Okay. I'm going to pray and get out of here. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercies, Father. We thank you that through this uh, situation with the, the, the whole world is under, Father, we pray that you would continue to, to work in the lives of people, um, bring them to you that they might uh, know you as Lord and Savior. We thank you for your mercies. What a great and wonderful God we have. Now as we get into the rest of the service, we ask that you would bless Pastor Jeremiah, open his heart, open his um, understanding, give us new knowledge, new understanding of you and your glory and your beauty. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, so 1130, those are supposed to kick on because they will not wake up right now. So, sorry. All right, um, so I, most of you know that I don't like the title pastor, right? I don't like being called Pastor Jeremiah. Um, um, and I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> um, uh, but, hey, yeah, uh, I don't care. Um, but there's actually a reason why, okay? There's a reason why. Um, usually, I will get introduced as pastor, um, and I don't like that. And the reason, the, here's the reason why. Because usually when I'm introduced as a pastor, one of two things happen. The person I'm introduced to either becomes really, really holy, <laughs> um, and they start telling me about all their good deeds, and I go, I don't care. <laughs> like, I mean, this isn't a competition. Um, and, or they go the other way, and they become very defensive. And it comes to the point where, in some cases, it gets so bad that they start uh, picking apart everything I say. And when I say something wrong, they'll go, aha, you know, and they'll, they'll bring up verses, and they'll bring up, like, the verse that we talked about last week, which was Matthew uh, 7, 1 through 5, where it says, do not judge. I'll be like, I thought you were not supposed to judge. And so things like that happen. But when I'm not introduced, when I'm just Jeremiah, the conversation goes a lot smoother, and I can actually get to deeper spiritual conversations with people through that. And so that's why. So if you ever introduce me and be like, this is some bum I know, um, <laughs> that'd be fine. Um, and so, but, yeah. Um, and so that's, that's really the reason why. Um, and so just this idea of 
being with defensive people, right? It's, when we do that, um, judgment is usually the main thing that I come across when I'm talking to people. Is you're, Christians are not allowed to judge. And this idea um, is really rooted in the fact that we do such a poor job of it, right? It's not that the Bible says not to judge. We actually talked about that last week. But it's really that the church in general has done such a bad job with it that any little slip up, I actually had one guy, I was talking to a guy, before I moved down here, I was at a barbecue with my, um, with my family, and it was, it was at my sister's house, so the, her husband, he works for Budweiser, um, he's like a little, uh, he's a regional manager, and so he goes around and does stuff, anyways, um, so he had some guys over, well, guess what I was introduced as? The pastor, right? And so um, I was talking to this one guy. One guy went the holy route. The, one, the other guy went the defensive route. And with the defensive route guy, it was really bad because it got to the point where um, I started making headway, right? And he was talking about how uh, Christians, it's all to you, talking to the pastor, me. He says, it's all a business to you guys. It's just making money. And I said, well, at this point, I'm not even a pastor technically. I'm just, you know just hanging around. Um, and I said, it's not about business. I, I care about people's lives. And at the end, though, I did this really messed up, um, you know, I just, a slip of the tongue. I'm like, that's why I'm in the business of souls. You know, and then, it, and then he goes, aha. <laughs> you know, and I gotcha. And it's this defensive thing. And so as, today, we're going to be talking about judgment again because... That's where 1 Corinthians takes us. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 today. And we're actually going to be covering two chapters today. Okay, But usually during the summertime, we take a, ver a, a piece of scripture, a, a, a book of the, of the Bible, and we go through it and we look at the overarching uh, theme of it, right? We go through, and we don't really spend a lot of time on any particular verse, but rather we, we read a chapter, we read a passage, and we look at how the whole book is trying to tell us something, right? And so that's what we tend to do. But sometimes Scripture is so dense in the sense of it, there's so much there, we have to come back. And I'm going to tell you right now, we don't have enough time to go through chapters 5 and 6 the way they should be. So we're going to do the overarching topic today, and then next week we're going to get into some details about it because it's something that we need to talk about. Okay, There are things that are talked about in this passage that we have to go deeper because if we don't, there's going to be misunderstandings about them. In fact, I had a, mis a, a conversation with a lady um, about two months ago about something that's in this verse that she didn't understand and completely misunderstood what was being talked about there. And so we're actually going to cover that next week, okay? But to bring us up to speed on where, where we're at today, let's talk about what we've done so far. So in the first four chapters, okay, it's getting to that point where before it was like week one we did this, week one, two we did this and all this. It's getting to the point where we're doing so much that we're going to be doing Here's the overall arching theme so far. So in the first four chapters, we saw Paul, his whole purpose of writing this, okay? And if we miss this, we miss the overarching purpose of 1 Corinthians, which is the church needs to be united, right? The church has to be united. He's writing 1 Corinthians so that the church would be united. When we start talking about what we're talking about today, you're going to be like, how does this unite the church, Right? But that's Paul's intention, is to unite the church. So, that's the first thing. But then he goes in, for four chapters, he starts tackling issues that are going on in the Corinthian church because the Corinthian church is not unified. Right? And so, he starts talking about these three things of leadership. And he starts with, who's the main leader? That's Jesus. He has the utmost authority. And when we put human leaders in front of him, or we say, I follow this leader, or this, I, I get my spiritual feeding from this particular leader, and we don't put that underneath Christ, we will cause disunity. Second thing he talked about is what is the role of a leader? 
right? What is their actual job? They're not supermen or superwomen, right? They are planters and waterers. That's what their main job is, okay? So we can't elevate them above that. Once we elevate them above that, we be become an idol for us. And so he talked about that. And then last week, he talked about what is Paul's specific job with the Corinthian church. And he views himself as a spiritual father. Okay? He views himself as a spiritual father to them. Because he's the one that planted there. He's the one that started the, getting the church in Corinth going. And so he views them as his children. And so he talks about how, as leaders, that our job is to really help the churches along to help them grow. But he said in order to do this, and this is what we covered last week, is judgment has to happen. And he specifically starts with where judgment has to happen. Does anyone remember where it has to start? Right here. It has to start with us. As individuals, judgment has to start with us. And so that's what Paul talked about last week, is that his role is to be a father to them, and he starts this by judging him. He doesn't judge himself. He brings himself before God and says, God, judge me. And so that's where he starts. So uh, leaders, that's where we have to start is going to God. Believers, that's where we have to start before we can go down because now Paul's going to lead us into something that if we don't start there is going to cause disunity. All right? So let's get into this. 1 Corinthians chapter one, or chapter 5, sorry, in verse 1. It says, now he's going to dive into these other issues that are causing division in church. It reads, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among the pagans. A man and his father's wife, um, a man and his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out your fellowship, the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit, and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this just as if I were present. When, uh, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. And then this is a, a, a pivotal verse, or a, a verse 9. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. We're going to reread that, though. Okay? So, what's going on? The guy... In the Corinthian church, okay, he's a believer. Um, they're fellowshipping with them, so they're eating with them, they're meeting together with them, and he is having sexual relations with his father's mother or his father's wife. Okay, now this this can be a couple of different things, right? This could be a mistress, this could be a stepmother, this could be several different things. But what it isn't is his biological mom, okay? So he's not having a sexual relation with his biological mom. But that does not matter. In, anci in the ancient world, this is, would be considered incest. Even though they are not biologically related, it's still considered incest. Okay? In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 18, I believe it's verse 8, you have this condemned by, the, by God. Okay? So within Jewish culture, this is condemned. But even in Roman law, this is still condemned. And so when Paul says in that opening verse where he says, this isn't even something the pagans practice, he's saying everyone involved in this, whether it be the Jews who had the, the Torah or it be the, the Greeks who have the Roman law, no one thinks this is okay. So this is a situation that no one thinks is okay. But then he says, but you Corinthians, you're proud of it. You're proud of what's going on. Now, there's something that we need to talk about because later on, if you still have your Bibles open, in verse uh, in chapter 6, in verse 12, this is a verse that gets 
um, talked about or spoken on. It says, everything is permissible for me. And then Paul responds with, but not everything is beneficial. But that verse right there, everything is permissible for me, it seems to be a common Corinthian saying. You know, people go, well, that's cool, or um, it's, it's hotter in hell, or, you know, just like these sayings that we have. So that sounds like it's a Corinthian saying that they would say, remember, this is a situation where the Corinthian church is really well off. And so their saying is, everything, I can do whatever I want, is basically the saying. And in our society, we kind of have that same thing, right? I have rights, right? I can, you, you can't tell me what to do. I have, I have my rights, right? It's that same type of idea. And the Corinthians are saying this idea about how, oh, I, I can do everything I want. And Paul mentions that saying. He says, everything is permissible. And so it's almost like they're coupling that idea that the Corinthians have of I can do whatever I want with the freedom in Christ. And they're coupling it together. And even when there's sin around, they're like, oh, who cares? And so Paul's saying, you're proud. You're boasting in this. Like, this is an okay practice. And he's saying, no one, Jews nor the Romans, think that this is okay. And yet you Corinthians are, like, actually puffing it up. And so that's the situation that's going on. And so Paul also says, and that's why we read verse 9, I wrote to you to not associate with the sexual immoral. And so it's almost like, because we talked about how this is called 1 Corinthians. This isn't the first letter to the Corinthians. There was another letter that we don't have. And so in that letter, this is where Paul has already addressed this situation. So this situation has been growing and growing and growing to a point where it's almost infecting the whole church. And it's causing disunity. And so what does Paul say? He tells the people um, in verse 5, he says, Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Now, how many of you hear that and go, well, wait a second. Where is our right to judge? Anyone? Okay. Because this sounds like kind of a harsh thing. You know, in the Roman church, excommunication. Right? You excommunicate someone. You know, there are cults that do this, that push people out and say you cannot associate with that person anymore. And it almost sounds like Paul's saying just the same thing. But we have to begin with the understanding of what is Paul's desire? What's that first thing that Paul said he, he desired? Unity, Unity right? And so this is not causing unity. It's causing division. And so he's addressing it. And so this is why we have. And so he says, hand this man over to Satan. And he's saying that you hand him over. You say, okay, you can go your way. And actually, if you read through Romans 1, Paul talks about this idea that God has given us over if we're into our sinfulness, if we so choose. He gives us over to it. And so... This whole idea is what Paul is talking about. And so he talks about how this is his desire to give him over to it. But what's the purpose? Verse 5. And his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Paul's not saying get rid of this guy because he's a jerk. He's a loser. We don't want him around. Right? He's saying don't fellowship with him because we want him to be saved. We want him to return to the Lord. We want this whole situation to be rectified. All right? So he goes through that, and then at the end there, he talks about this whole yeast and Christ and the Passover lamb. This whole idea of fellowship, of communion, is a huge thing. You know, when we take communion, a lot of times it's kind of this individualized thing, right? We take the bread, we take the, the cup, and we do this. Right now, when Paul's to take communion meant that you are fully invested into Christ. That you are willing to now take the punishment of the world against any of those that claim Christ. Because when, Jesus, when Paul talks and he uses the word Lord, that same word is used of Caesar 
okay, the Roman emperor. And when they call Jesus Lord, they're saying that he is equal or greater to Caesar. That's what they're saying. And so to the Romans, that's why they got in such trouble with the Romans, because they were having someone that was above Caesar, and you could not do that. And so that's, so this whole idea with him saying, communing with this guy, you're boasting about it, you need to take him out of your fellowship. Okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that the church has to do something, right? The church has to make a judgment call. All right? But this isn't the end. All right? This isn't the end. He keeps going because he says, okay, you need to kick him out, right? And you get, he can't be associated here. But then the question we have to ask is, we thought we weren't supposed to judge, right? That whole thing. How many people have you encountered that call Christians judgmental hypocrites? A, a bunch, right? And it's because we don't realize the scope of our judgment, right? And Paul right now is going to give us where our authority is in judgment. Okay, so let's keep reading. Verse 9, we're going to reread it. It says, I have written you in my letter, so talking about before, not to associate with sexually immoral people. Verse 10, not at all meaning the people of this world. That's a huge thing. He's not talking about people that are not believers. Okay? Not at all the meaning of the people of this world who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. He's saying you can't disassociate yourself with all these types of people because then you have no one to talk to. Right? You couldn't go down and you couldn't buy groceries because that person might be an idolater. You can't go down and get gas because the person running that might be swindling you. You know, you can't engage with anything. That's what Paul's saying. So he's saying, I'm not talking about going out to the world right now. He's like, I'm talking about what's going on in church, okay, with the church, okay? So that's the first thing we have to recognize when we're talking about what Paul's going to be asking us to do, okay? Not, what Paul's asking us is not to go out of the unbelief, out to those who do not believe and start disassociating with them. He's talking specifically about what we do with other believers, okay? So we need to, we need to have that in our, our mind. Verse 11, but now I'm writing to you, writing you, you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, okay, so here's that church, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler, okay, those same things, but a person that calls himself um, a Christian, with such a man do not even eat, okay, so have that fellowship, that communion time, okay, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the man, a uh, wicked man from among you. Okay? So, Paul is calling the church to judgment. Right? He's calling them to judgment because he says expel the wicked, the wicked man. Okay. So now, the question is, what does that mean? Right? Is it just when people are having sin that we're supposed to judge? Now, what we talked about last week, we have to remember what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked about this understanding that when we're, if we're all on the same page, right? If we're all on the same page going, where does judgment begin? It begins here. If we're all on that same page, when I stumble, do I need to be judged by the church? No. What is going on right now that Paul calls them to judge? Sin is rampant through the church, and the church is boasting about it. Does that make sense? It's not just a small little infraction. It's not someone struggling with their faith. It's not someone struggling, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with the sin, and I'm going to God. It's not that. It's someone that is boasting, living sin, and saying, you know, it doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want, and sin is okay. That's what we're talking about here. It's not just that. 
If it was just that, then we would have to be looking for sin, right? Paul doesn't end it there. He doesn't say that's the, that's the only problem. Ver, uh, chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that you will be, you will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one? Uh, but, but instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this is in front of unbelievers. So Paul's saying, look, it's not just this guy that is sinning that's the problem. People are having disputes as believers to believers, and instead of going to godly men and women and asking, can you judge her? Instead of doing that, they're going outside to unbelievers. And so Paul's saying, Here, here's the problem that's going on with you, Corinthians. He's saying, you're letting sin run rampant, and you don't give. You don't care at all, right? Second, you're going in front of non-believers and hanging out your laundry. You ever hear that saying, right? Where you just, we have it, the modern thing is you go on Facebook, right? Is you go on, and it's just all out there. I've recently seen that done between two believers, and I was really upset. You know, I know we we all. Do. And Paul uh, Paul is saying, don't do that. There has to be someone, and he says even someone least in the church can, should be able to do this, should be able to judge. And so what he, Paul is saying is, we're not taking the judgment, the authority of the church to make judgment calls within the church very seriously. And he actually goes on to say about lawsuits in verse 7. He says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. So first off, just because you have disputes, you already, you already have problems. Okay? But now you're compounding the problem. He says, why not rather be cheated? Instead of going before believers and showing that you really don't have a, a strong faith in Christ, which means that you're, you're cheapening the grace that you have in front of unbelievers. What are they going to think of Christ if you can't even deal with these small little issues? He's like, so it doesn't matter if it's big or if it's small. The problem that the Corinthian church, church is having is they're not taking their responsibility of being an authority judge in the situations of other believers. And that's a huge thing. Because right now, in the church, in the modern American church, when we talk about what's called church discipline, I have watched people go, well, wait a second. Where does the church have the right? I was, uh, years ago, as a youth, um, we had a situation, and it was really funny. Because one person, there's, there's one person, they have, they're long gone. Um, they came to me, and they're like, you should deal with this situation. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, 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 trying to go where God leads. So finally it came to a point where I dealt with the situation. Same person comes back to me and says, How, where do you have the right to talk into this situation? I'm like, I can't win. But I was having a Sunday school class with our teens, and we go through this thing called the basic doctrine of the church, and we do it with the, with the adults as well. And there's a point where we talk about church discipline. And one of the girls raised her hand and says, who gives you the right to make a judgment call in my life. And I said, the Bible. And I'm just not going to be judging you. It's not, that's not, and I, we had to go through the whole thing, which we're going to do today. And the thing is, is this isn't, we have to make a real clear thing here. We're not talking about just making judgments, right? It's not just randomly saying, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're not doing this, right? It, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about situations where there's problems being willing to do it, right? I don't know if you were ever taught this. I was always taught, deal with your problems, right? If you have a problem with someone, talk to them. 
It's one of the most annoying things to be passive aggressive, right? Because nothing gets done. I'm very passive aggressive in my life because I, I don't care about things. I just be like, I don't care, just move on, right? That gets me in trouble a lot of the time because then the p- problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and then I have to deal with it. And so that's always a problem. And so uh, Paul is saying we need to start dealing with these things. We need to take the authority of the church that was given to the church by God to actually take it and be responsible with it. Okay? So the question is, where does Paul get this? Right? Is Paul just talking and just making stuff up? The reality is this comes from Jesus. So we're going to go to Matthew 18, and we're going to talk about what Jesus talked about. Now, this is kind of long, but we, I think we can finish roughly under, you know, two hours. So, um, <laughs> so you guys giggle, and some other people are like, what? <laughs> um, and, but... But we need to start with this. Let's talk about the process by which uh, God has given us authority to judge. Okay? The first thing is let's talk about um, let's talk about the purpose, right? What is the purpose of judgment? It's not to call people out, right? It's not to be like, you over there, you have done this, right? That's not the purpose. The purpose is to bring people to repentance. That's what what Paul talked about in verse 5, chapter 5, right? His desire isn't that people would just be kicked out of the church, but rather that that man would come to repentance. And guess what? In 2 Corinthians, the guy does. He takes the discipline of the church, and he goes, you know what? I was wrong. And then Paul tells the church, because the church is like, should we take him back? Paul's like, yes, take him back. Yeah, that was the point. He's like, he's repentant. Bring him back. That's the whole. So the purpose of judgment is repentance. If that's not the purpose, the rest of it, that's why we have disunity. Because people are just out to get people. Right? We can't do that. And so when someone, and this this is a, a believer to believer thing. We talked about last week. You know, I used Ken as the example. Um, that If Ken came to me, I have to be willing to say, okay, right? We have to have that willingness to be corrected by each other because that's why God puts us here, right? So what's the, first perp- uh, what's the purpose? Is to bring repentance, right? That's the purpose. Okay, now our attitude, our personal attitude in this, okay? This comes from two places. Um, Matthew 26, verse 41, is this idea that Jesus is in Gethsemane, And he tells the people, pray that you you might not be led into temptation. And later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul reiterates this idea of we don't want to fall into temptation. Okay, So just this idea of what our attitude in this whole thing, i got to be in prayer okay, because I don't want to fall into sin. So I need to be going back to God, right? Where does judgment start? It starts right here. It starts with our, us as individuals. And guess what the first step is in judgment of the church? I need to sit down and say, God, where am I going wrong? Is, am, I, am I doing something that I shouldn't be doing right now? Is there something, some way I'm sinning? Am I causing problems? Am I causing division in my, in my family, in my church, anywhere that's the first step. So we have to have it clear in our minds that the purpose of this process is to bring repentance. We personally have to have a prayerful um, attitude that says, I don't want to fall into temptation. And we have to say, God, start here. If we don't start there with those, everything that we're going to be talking about later is going to cause problems. Because then it's going to be petty stuff. It's going to be carpet, right? It's going to be donut choice, right? Those petty things that divides church. That's what happens when we don't take seriously the purpose of judgment in the church and our role in it, okay? All right, so now let's get into 
Matthew and see where we go from there. So Matthew chapter 18. Man, I'm way behind here. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus says this. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Okay? So here's a situation. You see your brother or sister, they have sinned. Okay? You've already, you're in this place where you're like, okay, I, what is my purpose here? It's repentance, right? Am I praying? Have I gone before God? Right? We're already at that stage. Okay. They're, they're sinning. I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to, actually, I'm going to come over here first. I'm going to tell Cody, hey, did you see? You see those people over there? You see, they're sinning. Is that what we're supposed to do? No. I know. Let's go on Facebook. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. You see this? You see what I just said about them? All right. Um, no. Our, we go straight to them. Right? We don't tell anyone. That's what Jesus just said. One on one. No one else needs to know this. They sin. We recognize it. We come to them and say, hey, I saw you do this. I want you to be strong in your faith. And we're, we're there. We're encouraging them. And, and Jesus says, if they repent, yes. He says, you've gained a brother, right? And what do you do? It's over. We don't have to do anything else. What if someone came to this man that was sinning and said, hey, man, this isn't okay. Like, all right? What, what, Paul, would, we would have a, a whole chapter out of 1 Corinthians gone. If someone would have just went to this man and said, hey, stop messing around. Okay? And so that's the first thing. But what if you go to that person and say, forget you. Well, Jesus has verse 16. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that, that, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, it's really easy to find a couple of people that will be on your side to go over there and start harassing someone. It's really simple, right? Because you want to be right. But that's not what, what the purpose of this. These witnesses in the Old Testament were nonpartisan, right? They were nonpartisan. They were people that were, I will judge you just like I will judge that person, right? Equal here. And that's the thing is we have to be willing because I've, I've recognized this in my own life, that there are things that really annoy me about other people that I do, right? And so we could easily go to someone and say, you know, I see you're messing up there. You're sinning here. And they're like, no, I'm not. And they're like, well, I'm going to go get a couple of people, and we're going to come beat you, okay? And we bring the, but if we bring nonpartisan people, we we'll come over and say, this person is doing this. And they look at us and go, no, they're not. That's you. Yeah, not you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, yeah. But that's, right? That's what Jesus is trying to avoid, is someone just picking someone out. And instead, we have, and this is the thing, at the beginning of that, we have to be willing to be wrong. I would actually, I'd rather be wrong than be right sometimes. Because if I'm right about something, then, then I have to do more work. I'd rather be wrong and be like, okay, hey, that's good, you know, let's move on. And th those two people or one or two people that are nonpartisan, they look at that and they go, you know what, no, they're actually not doing that. Or th they might help us understand it was a, a missed opportunity, you know, um, I had a I was driving the church van in the light parade a few years back, okay? Driving, and I, if you know me, I like to drink Pepsi, right? One of the teens had gotten me a Pepsi in one of those little bottles. So I'm drinking it and driving the thing, and I hear, that guy has a beer. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> but it's, it's that simple miss. What if someone else is like, the pastor has a beer, and then it goes everywhere, right? And Facebook, and they take a picture, and there I am like this, and you know, it's those simple things, right? If you ever watched the, the TV show Seinfeld, yeah, remember this episode? Where he's, 
right? And they thought he was picking his nose, right? It's those, those two witnesses could help uh, the situation by saying, you know, it was a misunderstanding, right? Or we're at fault. Hey, that would be great. And then it's like, then from us, it's, you know, please forgive me. We have to be willing to be wrong. We have to be willing to repent ourselves and ask for forgiveness. We can't ask someone to repent and ask forgiveness if we ourselves aren't willing to do the exact same thing. And so that's the situation. So if they, Jesus says, hey, if they repent, hey, you're good, right? Everything's good. But what if they don't? And this is verse 17. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And this is where we find the Corinthian church. They're in verse 17. It has gotten to a place where, and this is the thing that we have to understand. From verse 16 to verse, or from verse 15, it's a one-on-one thing, right? It's very, let's not talk about this other people. Let's just deal with the situation. If it gets to verse 16, it's already becoming a problem, right? It's getting bigger. And it's getting big enough to where other people are going to be able to start noticing it because now these two witnesses, they're, they're judging the situation because they know more of the, what's going on. But then Jesus says, if it gets to verse 17, where do you take it? You take it to the church, right? Now, this could be small things, like what Paul was talking about in chapter 6, where he's like trivial issues of disputes. Like I said, I, I saw this between two Christians just recently in the last couple of weeks. And I was so upset with one of those Christians because they purport to be a Christian, but they took this person that was doing their job and just ramrodded them in front of non-believers. And I was so upset with them that they did this. And so, but it's, it's this little, so could be a trivial thing you know small thing that we're like hey we can't get um this fixed so we're going to bring it in front of the church right or it could be something really big like what's happening in chapter five but here's the thing what happens when you bring an issue to a big group everyone has their opinion right welcome to congress right everyone has their opinion and nothing gets done so it's got to be something that we're willing to have some problems with, right? Because what if I, um, I'm having this problem with, jo- with um, John over here, and I'm like, John, let's go before the church, and, and then the church goes, Jeremiah, you're wrong. Am I willing to go before a group of people and be wrong? That's a big thing. i got to really start, remember, what do we start at the beginning? Make sure that going before God and saying God judges, we got to be really sure that that's what that that we're in the right, right? To bring it before the church. But then the church has a responsibility too. And this is what the Corinthians weren't doing. Because what were they doing with the man and his mother, uh, his father's wife? They were boasting about. They were in sin themselves. What were they doing with the lawsuits? They were allowing it to go out to unbelievers. The church was not taking their responsibility seriously. And so it puts us into a predicament when the, the group is not spiritually ready for this. Because as soon as it happens, you have people on one side and people on the other. And it doesn't matter who's right. If Jeremiah or John is right, it doesn't matter. It matters who do I like more. And then we start seeing splits. I saw this in our church several years ago. There was two groups, and one, they wanted it this way, and they did this, and we had another group that wanted it this way. And I remember sitting down with one of the people that eventually left the church, and I asked them, do you think that you have gone through Matthew 18 rightly and they dodged the question and moved on because they knew that it wasn't the correct way of doing it and so when things are brought to us if i if i were to bring something in front of you right now and said this is an issue we're having in the church here's what's going on and i bring the you know and 
I know this in our American Christianity, this is just something that you should not do, but you bring up the stuff. And the person, John's over here, and he's like, this is my case, I give it to you. And I said, here's my case, I give it to you. We have to be able to say, where does God want us to go here? And we, as a group, say, okay, this is what we're doing. And we have to, let's say I'm over here and I disagree, right? I disagree with this. There are things that in our ministry I will present to the others, right? And they think sometimes it's a good idea, right? And sometimes they don't think it's such a good idea. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them telling me, no, let's not do that. Because my skin is not in the game as far as I need to be right. I like to be right. But my desire is that the church would be healthy, right? That, and that, as we're looking at these situations, we have to go, I really like John, but he's wrong. He's in sin. And my desire is not for John to leave, but John to come to repentance, right? And if he so chooses to leave and not repent, it's his choice. And so, but we have to be unified when those things come. You know, and if I look around and I, and I ask, say we do this, and I ask the church, okay, the, you have a judgment to make. And the church decides on an action, and I'm over there, and I'm in the back, like, I'm, I'm Fred now. I'm Fred in the back, and I go, you know what, though? Yeah, John's a jerk. Yeah, John's been sitting, but I like John, and I'm going to go with John. We can't be doing stuff like that. We have to go, no, sin. This is why taking sin so seriously is important. Is important in our lives. This isn't going around just picking people's sin, right? We shouldn't be doing that. But when it gets to a point where it's something that has to be brought, we have to say, you know what? We have to take this seriously right now. Because we want repentance. We want people to come back to Christ in a full way. And that's what... Paul is trying to get at here. And then Jesus says, you treat him like a pagan or a tax collector. Those types of people were looked down on, right? But what did you, how did Jesus treat them? He still loved them. He still had compassion on them. But he understood that they are not, they're far from God. And it's the same th thing. If, if um, John's over there and he's, you know, the church has decided, yeah, John, you need to repent. And John's like, no, forget it. I'm, I'm out. I'm done with you people. We can still love them. We can still have compassion on them. But when we interact with them, we have to know. We have to remember our minds. They're in rebellion. I need to be praying for them. I need to be encouraging them to come back to the faith, come back to being a part of the church, because that's what it is, to come to repentance. That's a huge thing to do. And it's easy to become disunified over it. In a second, it can happen. And we have to take it very seriously and very slow and have at the purpose that God would be glorified and people would be repented and unity would be established. And one of the great things in verse 11 of chapter 6, Paul says this. He's talking to them. To the Corinthians, right? And he's talking about, the, uh, and we're going to get more into this next week, about people that aren't in the kingdom of God, the swindlers and the idolaters, all those things that we've already talked about. But then Paul says this to them. He says, and that is what some of you were. It was reminding them, look, you were also unrepentant. You were also far from God. So don't be treating people like you're superior to them. And this is why we're called to be prayerfully remembering that we can fall into temptation just as easily as anyone else. And so we need to, as we're going through this, say, hey, John, I'm not out to get you. My desire is that you are built up, that you are the, the person God created you to be, to do the work that he has called you to do, that's my desire. And if you think that I'm out just to, to rag on you, 
And if any of you have known me for any long of the time, I don't say much into people's lives as far as like, you need to fix this. I don't say that that often. I say it to like Jack, there's a lot there. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. Um, but there's a couple of people I've spoken into their lives and it's caused problems. And so I'm very slow to speak into people's lives because I spend weeks of prayer before I talk to them about anything. And it's because I've seen how quickly it can turn. Because if someone's really in sin, how many of us, when we're in sin, want to be pointed out? No. We want the sin. It's very, you know, it's like when, I tur- when I'm upset, I don't turn on Christian radio. I probably should. I usually turn on about 70s rock. Because <laughs> I want, the, you know, 70s, 80s, I just want the pounding. Because I want to be angry. You know, there's that song, I just want to be mad for a little while. All right? But this is what we're called to. We're called to this understanding that we have a responsibility and we really need to take it seriously. So my, uh, my challenge for you this week is to read through Matthew 15 through 17, the verses we read this week, and start going to God and saying, God, am I spiritually ready to do this? In my life, am I active in sin and therefore, I've canceled my authority in this area. Or, Lord, can you go through my life and start showing me what the sins in my life so that we can deal with this? So that if you've ever called me to this, I'm ready to go. Okay? Just something simple like that, just to go through these verses this week. All right? Because God has called us to a lot of things. And a lot of times, we're not ready for them. And one of those things is this. And I'll tell you this, this is probably the hardest thing as a church that we are responsible for because it can easily go sideways real quick. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church. I thank you for this group of believers right here. Lord, help us be unified under Christ. Help us to understand his authority over us. Help us to understand where we stand with you. That we are, we're beggars that found food. Father, I thank you that you have allowed us into your presence. Lord, clean us up. Look into our lives and just start taking stuff out that is not of you. Lord, and if we ever have to come to this, which I, I pray that we never do, but Lord, that we would be ready, a people prepared for that day and that whatever the situation repentance would happen you would be glorified and your church would be built so father i thank you it's in your son's name i pray amen there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of
since this is Margaret and I last Sunday for a while. Would you stand with us, please, singing I'll Fly Away. Some bright morning when this life is over, i fly away somewhere to that home on God's celestial shores. I'll fly away. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Love you all, and I'll miss you.